and say something, sir. Hello. I don't think they can hear you. Uh, <laughs> uh, this nigga is trying to be cool. Hi guys, welcome to the School Fears Podcast. What's up? How's it? How's it? Hope everyone is good. And we're back. I told you guys, you know, we thought uh, we wouldn't be back with consistency, but we're here. It is what it is. We've been consistent the last two weeks. Yeah, okay, but they don't know that. <laughs> so, y'all, today we are doing another different thing. Instead of doing a book review, we thought we'd chat about the ideas of a book and how they are applicable to us. Your parents didn't teach you to actually greet people and Oh, actually, yourself? sorry, sorry. Hi. Yeah, I don't know who you are. Yeah, like, like, I, 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 I want to watch you. So, like, when he's sitting like, like, next to me, he's doing the cab. <laughs> and I. Remember, remember to learn and I wasn't, we're, we're trying to get our dates. Uh, yeah! Uh, and, and we're trying to get people uh, uh, to respond to our dates. Uh, and unless they know who we are, and they know that, oh, this is actually this is the, the guy who followed me. This is the guy who followed me and then follow back. Unless they know that it's actually us. Sure. Like, please. Actually, sorry everyone, I jumped the gun there. I am Ludwe and this is... I am Tulani. And I'm Daryl. Uh, oh, well, you have a deep voice there. Yeah. <laughs> I hope this is not the only time. I hope this is the only time he jumped the gun too quickly. Oh! Uh, <laughs> we won't talk about that. Uh, coming with shots so early in, eh? Okay, we'll see you. we we'll see you. I hope your experiences are longer than how you make noodles. <laughs> anyway, hi guys. What are we chatting on today, bro? Uh, we are talking about, the, as I said, we're talking about the ideas of this book. This is the Capitalist Nigger. It's a little black. I don't. But anyway, we're gonna. You're gonna see the whole white thing once you did as that in the video. Uh, Capitalist Nigger. Yeah. yeah, it's by Dr. Chika Onyari. I have to say, it's been practicing for the last ten minutes. And I think I butchered it. <laughs> something. <laughs> Luto asked Daryl, yo dude, um, obviously Daryl originates from Uganda, you know, um, and then he's like, yo dude, how do you pronounce this? And then Daryl's like, I'm not Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he knew how to pronounce it too. <laughs> so we find ourselves in this position. Yeah. But forgive us for, if we have mispronounced. Um, the author's name, yeah. please forgive us. But yeah, Ludwig, tell us a bit more about the book. Um, so we'll chat about the ideas as I've sort of alluded to. So for me, this is a book or the idea of us as, as a black people. Collectively, we need to kind of wake up. I think the author really goes deep into how we have been blaming other ethnic groups for our downfall or for the lack of um, financial um, prosperity, so to speak. Lack of emancipation. Financial emancipation, yeah, that, that's probably a good way. Um, and although the author would say, yes, most African countries have been independent for a while now, but in terms of reality and how that has materialized for the people or as a collective group, that really hasn't changed much. If anything, he argues that it's actually gone worse. Um, and we really need to sort of confront this topic head on and how we as a collective really need to step up our game mm. we need to look at other ethnic groups and how they've done it be it the author goes compares with your caucasians i'm actually using the diction from the book or your east indians and how they have this idea of um what he calls it he calls it the web spider web spider doctrine. web doctrine yeah where they basically like help each other out and try and keep the money flowing within the community for its tenant periods of time. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And yeah, I just wanted to hear what you guys think about that. Uh, so before we jump into that now, um, having read the book, mm. um, as, a, as, as a person of color, or as a rather MC, as a black individual, how did you guys find the first few chapters? Because just speaking from my experience, the first few chapters, it is like, it's like being scolded by a parent. It's not, not dark. Being scolded is like putting it lightly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like punches on punches on punches. <laughs> like, like the use of, the, the use of vocabulary. Yo, mm. 
Like, like I think he goes out of his way to make sure that you're uncomfortable as you are reading it. Absolutely. Mm. He confronts you, <laughs> looks you dead straight in the eyes and be like, you are terrible. You haven't done much. You are freaking consuming everything. You're not producing. And he basically is sort of like your uncle when he's angry mm. and just tells you point for point that, look, mm. you need to step up your game. Mm. And, and what did you say is, um, because there's a number of people I know started reading this book mm. and haven't finished it because of that mm. um, because the way I gathered is you basically get hammered for the first few chapters and then after that he kind of gets into how what can. his ideas are about how as, as, as black people we can improve our economic situation um, and I think first thing which I just want to unpack or jump into is why do you think that's so hard for us to get through that to be confronted with with yo, that which is giving yo, us. Yo, Daryl came for conversations today. Yo, 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 so I've been going on days. So yeah, I have to have, I have to have, I have to get my words in somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your boy is lonely, eh, okay, guys? Um, please, remind please. us of, of your uh, question again, so that we actually yeah. talk. So, so to summarize what I essentially said. First few chapters are incredibly hard to get through because he essentially tells you, for lack of whatever, word, black person, you're shit. Mm. Right? You're shit. You're useless. You're lazy. You don't produce. Your your situation is your own fault, essentially. Yeah. And you're right. quick to blame others. Yeah, and you're quick to blame others. Right? I think many people I know read the book, mm. can't get past that point to get to when he starts sharing his principles how we can improve our situation. So my question is, why or what is it do you guys think about what he's saying which makes it so hard for us to confront all of that? And do you think he's even justified in saying that to us? So, okay, do you want to... I think he is justified. Ryan, he's black. To he actually has a good intention. Okay. Like he's you don't see that at Inception, though. Yeah, no. It's very difficult to, to read through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that silver no. lining is. Yeah, at, well, at, it's, at it's, Inception, it's, at Inception, like I kid you not, if you don't make it like to the later stage, <laughs> you don't see the love. The, you don't see the love out of it. Mm. Like it just like initially, like when I first read it, it just felt like those rich blacks who get rich and move to, in his case, he moved from uh, Nigeria to America mm. and suddenly now want to poke holes Back at other black Nigeria. people just because he's been the one that's managed to escape it and now suddenly he comes at it with like, oh my gosh, look at me, I've made it, why the heck are you guys still poor? That's true. That's how it sounded at inception. Mm. Mm. And I think it really stung because it kind of changes the whole narrative about us blaming others or expecting donations or expecting uh, help and it basically just puts the ownership and the onus on us like you are here and your situation is this and this because of you and your lack of action or your lack of uh, consistency um, so that's why it kind of feels like a personal attack in my opinion yeah where would you say that narrative comes from Ooh, um, a big part of it, I suppose, is maybe education. The whole idea of us having gone through slavery and, you know, Africa being wealthy in terms of minerals and, and all of that and things just being taken out and us not really uh, benefiting from that. And I think we always, I guess, have someone to blame, right? Which, you know, in context, there, there, must, there are reasons. Those reasons are still there. Mm. But I think that excuse has long time expired. Mm. Okay, to Lani. So, I want to first add to the actual context of the book, right? The first thing that he tries to debunk, right, is the idea that we all tell ourselves now, based on what I see on social media, that we happen to be these rich kings who <laughs> roam around Africa for years and years and years. Speaking to zebras and lions. Yeah, yeah, and, and we had all these things. And then he's like, um, we, uh, who's this, Musa Mansa or other way around? Mansa Mansa. Yeah, and then he's like, yeah, we like to tell ourselves that like before white people or colonialists, uh, colonial people came, we were living like as kings. as kings and like all these great lives, right? Then he says, the first people to come into Africa were actually Arabs, right? And then they um, kind of colonized us, right? Which is why a majority, I think, is it East uh, or West Africa where there's more Muslim people? Um, north, 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 north
uh, Sudan's and all those places. That's why those places, uh, even Cote d'Ivoire actually, like parts of Nigeria where he's from, are actually quite Muslim, right? So he says at, that started basically from the idea of Arab people coming and colonizing us. So that's the first thing he tries to debunk, right? And then he also says, isn't it weird that few men, right, from um, elsewhere, because he's in obviously um, not in South African context, but he's speaking from an East Africa, North Africa, West Africa perspective. These men came and we were so quick to give our other blacks away as slaves. The kings that we rave so much about, we were very quick to give to white people as slaves. And those people traveled kilometers via ship, right, to be slaves. And his argument is that if we were so smart and we were so great as kings, how come we could not even hold our own with a few white slave traders that came because if you actually like look at the story right like even um kendrick lamar has a book uh no he raps about it no sorry kendrick lamar raps uh king kunta right like 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 the story whether whether it's fictional or not the story of king kunta is like he was a prince and actually he was actually sold by fellow black people to white people it wasn't like white people were so easy in his mind to just infiltrate our black uh, what you call this empire empires right with money or deception and we the so-called blacks who love themselves were so quick to turn on each other the moment something better came and that's his first biggest argument mm. is that you don't find that elsewhere elsewhere and I, th I think it's it's something quite interesting. Now, if you if you look at, okay, now we're gonna kind of take a young detour, but I think it adds to a conversation. If you look at human beings over the course of history, I think there's one thing we know is that they seem Jordan to be. Jordan Peterson time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was <laughs> waiting for the moment. <laughs> um, if, you look, if you look at people throughout the course of history, that I it, there is an idea of one human being must dominate another. Right. Okay. Um, if we go, if we go way, 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 way back, right? The biblical times, right? The Egyptians colonized, you know, the Jewish people, right? The Greeks colonized Egypt. The Romans colonized Greece. And it's kind of like a, it. It was always a, you know, this person gonna colonize that person, gonna colonize that person, gonna colonize that person, gonna colonize that person. And we look at, I think most of the colonizers were generally the West or coming from um, parts of Asia. Sure. And what I find interesting is that up until the time when these colonizers came to West Africa, Africa wasn't much explored. Africa kind of ended at Egypt. Okay. And we know African culture is, in general, we're very accommodating, we're very warm. It's very much about community and, you know, looking after each other. And this was our initial introduction to the idea of shucks actually the conflict of you know someone trying to colonize us again outside of you know fights between villages and i was about to say all of that. are we as accommodating as we think we are if we look at action based because history tells us that mm -hmm. at any point in time where blacks have ruled over blacks um it hasn't been the greatest rule that we found a modern life. or old history you could say both. I disagree. I, I, well, I don't know enough about old history, mm. but obviously, mm -hmm. like your recent, mm. once countries have gotten independence, you have your dictators. Mm -hmm. You know, that has been a terrible experience. I, I'd, I'd say modern history, yes, but it's kind of that thing of, um, you saw it also in Soviet Union and Russia, right? The people who get into power, right, who liberate the ones you tell the narrative. Yeah, they tell the narrative and they eat, right? 1984. Right, you eat and to hell with the rest. Don't worry, guys. He just, <laughs> dropped, he, he just dropped the Trojan line. He just dropped the Trojan line. <laughs> no, but it's true. It's, it's, like, it's like the people to get into the power, mm. they eat, to hell with the rest. At some point, everyone else will figure it out. Right? Sure. Um, and so I think if we look at modern African history, that's generally the case. But, and, and here, here's, here's the thing which, and that's why I raised this point about this was as Africa as a country, it's our first exposure to that level of, you could say, conflict or war or dealing with that level of threats. 
Okay. Because throughout history, we're pretending as if in the Western world they didn't have their share of dictators. Sure. It's just those dictators were maybe in 500 AD, and us we're dealing with them in 2021. Right? True. So it's almost like a, it's like a cycle of. So are you implying that humans, when you know colonizers came through, we were sort of thinking they are our friends. You know, it's a collaborative, or we just were not expecting them to just bully us and take over as. As they did. I, I, I think our assumption was a lot more collaborative at first. Okay. Um, and they came in and what you know, guns? Uh, and with guns, were using yeah, spears and with guns and basically swept us over. Um, and also because we've never been exposed to a threat of that nature, mm. I don't think we're in the position to even comprehend about defending ourselves. Okay. So. Okay. So interesting. We, we're digressing a bit because the book actually doesn't really touch on post, let's say, 1940 mm. Africa, does it make, th- no, yeah. pre-1940 Africa, mm. right? He, he's literally discussing what's happened post-1940s Africa, mm. right? Because I think it would be unfair for us to have a conversation on, and which I don't like, like, I don't like us with hindsight having conversations about people in the 1800s mm. when white people came into Africa because we don't understand the context yeah, and it's a tricky one it's a tricky one to have an opinion about it to, to criticize the people at the time when we don't understand the kind of life that they're living for example down now I'll just say they might have just been people who are just accommodating uh-huh. like if another settler comes they say hey man uh, let's just share a portion of this land we can do this we don't understand the context of that and unfortunately there's not enough history written because history is written by the people who win the war, right? Yeah. There's not enough history written about these situations for us to have an actual opinion about it. There's a lot of history told about the Great Alexandria, and there's stuff written about it. Like, you can actually go on different points, right? But majority of the history that is written about these African leaders at the time comes from a white source who paints himself as the savior of these people who he's, he's, were nomadic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's and actually been prehistoric. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Think about that. Um, you guys remember the fire from the UCT African Studies lab? Yeah. That's just a sad thing in its case, given that we'll never really know. And there will probably know duplicates or copies. Of the history, yeah. yeah. But anyway, I digress. Um, okay, cool. So this book then chats about, I guess, us as a, as a people and how we then need to step up, right? Mm. And a big part of it uh, I think in the earlier chapters he also chats about us being consumers versus producers mm-hmm. and how uh, he kind of makes examples where in like a typical African home you'd find that um, we are consuming a lot of, we have won a lot of German cars, that's Europe, uh, we have a lot of electronics from Japan and that's Asia and just... Do you think every- that's a fair assessment? Um, in terms of? Of just solely bunching us as consuming people instead of producers. I think it's um, it's a perspective. Like when I think of, let's say you, if you are someone who's just made it big, the first thing you think of is one feeling or alleviating the feeling of feeling inferior. Okay. Right, and now you sort of you've arrived, you've established yourself. And I think in itself, that's a very good feeling. But then we tend to validate ourselves using all these external things that we that couldn't not have uh, produced. Can, that can, I, can I add something onto what you're saying? You know, if, if, if I think about your question now and in the context in which you wrote the book, obviously this is a book about, I would say business is more so economics sure. in, a, in, in a way. And I don't think black people aren't producers uh, because, you know, they are obviously, I'd say, there are black people who obviously they're farming and they look after themselves, they'd be subsistence farmers. However, I'd say the vast or in general, the black people have purchasing power, yeah. are not producers. That and they are not circulating within the community. Within the, within the community. Because but then it's not circulating within the community. Because they're not producing. Because as soon as you have more money, mm. right, you are not looking to buy something from your community, but also they may not be what you want produced in your very community True. to be able to spend that money. Look, this is where I agree with him, mm. alright? 
So for me, the question is, or the answer, in my opinion, is twofold, right? I think it's unfair for him to use Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs, and um, who's the richest Warren guy? Buffett. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. Yeah. Buffett. I think I think it's unfair, right? Because even those guys will tell you that they were in America, born at a certain time, of a certain um, race, what's it called? time, yeah, race, and household, gender, right? Just, well. yeah. So so things align for them in ways that. Even if a black person was born in America at the yeah, same yeah. time, they would not have the same opportunity. So I think it's very unfair because he uses those examples those to illustrate. Yes, yeah. he uses that example to illustrate the point of what you call this that black people don't uh, produce anything. He says like if these guys could do it at a garage, mm. but this just face the fact. Like the hard fact is the garage that these guys had isn't close to the garage that. However, there's people. something I want to I want to interject. I also, here. also want to because. Yeah. Um, in the book, when he speaks of the spiderweb doctrine, mm -hmm. I think that that is quite an eye-opening moment, and I think that is out of every one of uh, you know economists or whoever I've listened to, I'd say that's probably the the best attempt I ever heard at how we can put black people in a position to be producers. We'll get there. Mm. Um, another point that I want to make, well, hence I'm like I don't agree with that part of it. However, so. We live in South Africa. There's been a lot of xenophobic attacks, right? Especially in townships with the people who produce in townships, right? Um, it's, it's like people from Somalia, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, and all these places, right? And there, I agree with, right? Even though we're all black, but in that specific context, the people are seen as foreigners, right? And the black locals of South Africa don't want to produce. Right, but they buy at the Somali shops. These Somali shops make a lot of money, right? But based on history and the townships that I was in, the black people who are local that were there ran the shops to the ground. So I think in that point there's a fair assessment, right? In that point there's a fair assessment where there's been a foreign person who comes into this country with more hunger and they've produced a place where we as local South Africans um, produce that. So then the question is, he mentions a point, he mentions that example yeah. of us as locals, we tend to then uh, sort of have the boss mentality where I'm independent now, you basically, we, customer service is not a thing, right? <laughs> it's, it's a myth and basically it's what I want and you just so happen to be a customer that comes into my shop compared to how the other ethnic groups does it where everything is about customer service you know, get you at the best quality, quote unquote, cheapest price, and thus you sort of keep on coming back. And whereas in your boss mentality, you then buy things that the community doesn't necessarily want to buy on a consistent basis, and eventually cash flows dries up, you then selling old products, and that just is a cycle that, yeah. It taints the consumers. But sorry, before Jaya says anything, uh, I just want to add another thing to this, right? Uh, which I think that I think it's hard sometimes to have conversations where context is not put in place, right? Mm -hmm. So, majority of African countries were colonized, right? And I look at South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, in Soweto, they talk about electricity being free. So then we have to ask ourselves, who's at fault here? Is it the government who, who promised people that things would be free, mm -hmm. and that's how? They won the elections, which I didn't. I don't think they really had to. Or we were just so oppressed, right? That anything but that. Yeah, we just needed some some form of outlet as South Africans, right? So that's why I'm like, when I when I when I look at the ESCOM thing in Soweto, I'm like, it's a twofold thing. Um, the people who pay tax and everything are very quick to say that. Oh my gosh. Like, how come these people don't pay for anything, right? But the people who don't pay taxes, like, yo, guys, you, if you saw how some people live in this situation, mm -hmm. electricity is the last thing they think about. And to vote, they are promised these free things that they use, mm -hmm. which is why we never get to a point in South Africa, specific as black people, where we produce. Because we were told that being free means having liberties of just getting things for free. Yeah, that's concerned. Alright, so I want to dive a bit more into the whole 
idea of the spiderweb abduction. Because sure. I, I think that's probably the, the, the biggest concept that he shares in the book. Mm -hmm. And I think what I find very interesting with which, which he shares, just to lay the groundwork before we continue this conversation on it, is it is, it's very much, and the sense that I get when I read this book is very much a case of, okay, black person, you're in this situation because of X, Y, Z. This is what other groups are doing. Mm -hmm. This is the result it's given them. You have two options. Stay where you are and see where the rubber hole goes or learn from these other people and implement whatever um, principles it is that they use. And I like that um, thing to land you had mentioned it earlier, um, the, the case of foreigners moving into, uh, into another country, right? Um, and you mentioned that they don't have the, you say, the boss mentality. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, okay, we're here, we have nothing, we're dead poor, we need to make something Grand. out of nothing. Um, I love the example. I believe it was the I think you said it was the East Indians, yeah. um, which he which he had referred to, or to say the how they come into how they come into America, and they started off with the cab industry, newsstands. I say yeah, newsstands, and then cabs motels. and the motels, yeah. and then now they, they basically control large portions of America. Um, in those in those particular could I say sectors of the I could economy. say I could say those Indians. For example, who runs Google? It's an Indian guy um, who runs Microsoft. That's most tech companies. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Mm. And and it, so I I could say that like because the book was written quite long ago, right? Mm. So there's an extension mm. of these Indian peoples who came into America, right? Mm. You know, you can, yeah. mm. and, and and it's very interesting because you look at how it kind of gets built up. You move in, start off small. I know it tells a story of you know there'll be several. Uh, of them, you know, your cousin, your auntie, your uncle, yeah. the kids, the babies, you all stay in one room. And you live very lean, work really hard, work long hours, buy a second room. Yeah. And then the third, and then the fourth, and before you know it, you own the entire block. And the idea of um, the people who you employ are from your ethnic group or from your culture or speak the same language of you or whatever, mm. that's how you essentially give them a leg up. Uh, how they would never employ a, a white individual or a black individual or a, or, or a Hispanic individual in an American context. Um, they only employ an Indian person. Um, and it kind of raises the question of, as black people, um, mm -hmm. what is it, why is it that we don't do the same thing? Now, we have touched on it that, granted, if we consider our history, mm -hmm. when you have a little bread to eat, it's like, okay, I'm gonna make sure I enjoy this bread yeah. as much as I can to hold with the rest, right? But on the other hand, it's like, how were they able to figure it out? And how were we not able to figure it out? So he also, sorry, mentions um, sort of the issue between your African Africans and American Africans, mm. right? And, and how effectively the two don't really get along or there's like a bit of a dislike relationship mm. and how then when Africans go over to the United States you know be them be well educated or go there for I don't know high paying jobs they're not really feel they don't really feel welcomed and on top of that you then find a situation where as an African American African going to America you don't find yourself in a position where African Americans have created these businesses for you to join. Mm. That's a big part of it. But um, I really do think us finding things to validate once we've validated ourselves, once we've sort of made it, is uh, I suppose one of our biggest downfalls. Um, so, do you think that there's a lack of love in us mm -hmm. constantly comparing ourselves with other races and putting them on a pedestal because in majority of the rhetoric that I hear, right, uh. is that Indians, um, whites, Jews, just any other ethnic group is way better than us. Sometimes you it's yourself. subtle. Sometimes it's subtle, right? Because it comes, people come at it with, from a point of perspective of like, oh my gosh, they're doing better than us. But then when you listen to what they're saying, it's like actually this person generally thinks these people are better than